It's on the go, bro. What's going on, Comic Book Tribe? I am Molecular Maurice, and welcome to the Unmasked Comic, where we do comics on the go, bro. Let's get into it. In the ensuing issues, Steve Rogers makes a deal, taking over an apartment building he grew up in. Adopting this new task saves his neighbors from being evicted and also creates jobs. The old building resurrects memories Steve faced before he took the super soldier serum. Meanwhile, a present day vessel named Travis Lane has been instructed by the demon Asmodee to recruit a serial killer, Henry Cavanaugh, to destroy any heroes for change, therefore setting his sights on Captain America. Steve has come to an understanding about time, contemplating the scientific beliefs of Thor, Tony Stark, and Bruce Banner. The effects of survival and trapping us for decades blends his timelines together. The events of many yesterdays contributed to his future but present self. Steve lives in a constant time loop with his memories and emotions, but now realizes time is an illusion and these loops are put into sections to make sense in our brains. However, Steve's life as a super soldier has broken those segments and freed his mind. These are the thoughts that occupy Captain America, Steve Rogers, as he walks into a crime scene. There stands Misty Knight in an apartment next to a mummified corpse, apparently being the first set of remains in the US, falling in at number eight. Misty is puzzled how the body was burned to ash and bones, but the outside still remains while the building is intact. In addition, we witness at the same time there was a prior conversation between Henry Cavanaugh and the victim earlier in that same room. Misty's lead, the sister of the victim, was part of a group of AIM researchers. This team was deciphering codes used by the demon Asmodee's new vessel, Henry Cavanaugh. Although the victim kept his location secret, he sent the sister a file of the coding. She then gave it to Misty Knight, and as she showed Cap, he wondered why the sister would only give her an incomplete code. However, after the sister sent the code, she committed suicide by drowning herself in the pier. Misty then tells Cap that two of her operatives almost committed suicide as well, closing the case, but they were fast enough to save them. Cap questions Ames' motives, knowing that they usually don't deal with dark magic. At this point, asking Misty if she knows what the codes on the wall mean. Misty then directs Cap's attention to someone who would know, Dr. Stephen Strange. Except, Misty places a doll figurine on the table and conjures up some magical words. Once said, Dr. Strange appears communicating through the doll. When Dr. Strange needs to be in numerous places, he astral projects his spirit using familiars such as a doll or figurine thus allowing him to be in more than one place at once. Dr. Strange then explains that the symbols are shadow equations, which are used to create summoning circles, some to trap and hold demons, others for humans. The equation's main objective is to transform the room into a chamber. The demon can then con concentrate its efforts on the host or host without spreading to anyone or anything unintended. The explanation given by Stephen Strange transitions to Henry Cavanaugh explaining the same process to the last victim. This technique is enhanced the emissary's skill as he no longer keeps the bodies of the dead. This advancement has also aided Henry Cavanaugh to develop more thoroughly as the emissary. The room preserves the moment of death so the emissary can relive a sacrifice repeatedly. Thus he can play a victim's torment over and over. Kavanaugh smiles as his sick mind fingers his blade, figuring that the victim assumes that the blade will be his death. Kavanaugh assures the victim it will not. Instead, Henry Kavanaugh grins with deceit and proudly incinerates him. The tormented soul of the victim turned into a gem, which the emissary collects and places it in the box with the others. The conversation ends with Captain America, Misty Knight, and an astral projected Stephen Strange, directing Steve to look beneath the window, revealing a sigil of his shield. 
The three of them take this as a cautionary warning to guard his soul with his life. Brooklyn, 1938. A pre-Captain America, Steve Rogers stands as an onlooker at a pro-Nazi rally. The team of right-wing Aryans lure the common blue worker with rhetoric of unity. Sympathizers for an American Third Reich announced their call for members, rallying so-called pure-blood Americans to stand against migrants infiltrating the country. These words of power hold opposite to the disgust of Steve Rogers. Again, voicing his opinion alone in a crowd of believers, Rogers questions their motives time and again, challenging their anger as unjustified. The main speaker welcomes Steve's questions to prove a point of the youth being misguided. Steve tells the Nazi speaker that there are iron swords and steel swords. Iron can break and becomes brittle as it is one metal only, but steel can bend and continue to serve its purpose. This is because it is made of different elements. Thus, like America having different people makes the nation stronger. But the speaker just accuses him of using communist analogies urging Steve to go back to the commons and stop wasting your time. Get out of here, you commies! However, his words are not good, as he was also noticed by a notorious mobster during that time, Meyer Lansky, the Jewish gangster. As Steve continues the walk, one of the other Nazi members confronts the speaker. He tells him Rogers is not a threat, and once things kick off, he will be their strongest member. Then before Steve can cross the street, a car pulls up screeching and blocking his path. The back door opens and Meyer Lansky urges Steve to come with him to discuss an opportunity. Meyer brings Steve to his place of operations, offering him food while walking him through to his office. Meyer wastes no time, explaining that his men had given him reports of how this scrawny kid is always challenging the Nazis. Myers likes Steve's heart as it reminds him of himself. He has gotten roughed up like Steve in the past. Meyer knows Steve's is a heart that encourages others to use their voice instead of living in fear of Nazi rise. But before he gets to this point, he asks him, what makes him continue to speak against the Reich openly, knowing he will get pounded by them? Steve walks toward the window and gives a long-winded answer while gazing out. At the end of the day, Steve says the Nazis move and operate as bullies, and bullies are cowards. So in essence, there is nothing to fear from a coward or a bully. They will always get theirs in the end. After his mini-speech, Meyer gets down to business. His crew is Italian and they have to deal with the threat of Mussolini, just like Meyer being Jewish has to deal with the Nazi threat. Meyer asks Steve to keep going to the rallies and functions because him and his gangster looking associates, they can't go. Meyer realizes that the Nazis don't see Steve as a threat, making it easy for Steve to gather intel and report back to Meyer, especially when he hears about Operation Guard. In turn, I suppose, he will receive full protection from Lansky's crew if things get out of hand for him. Although these memories were an ice frozen Steve Rogers ago, it is like the same song on repeat. Meanwhile, bringing us six weeks ago to the present time at AIM Island, Ariana, Henry Cavanaugh, and Travis Lane assemble for the next phase of the emissary plan. Ariana and Travis explain how their machine part, super soldier serum, science, and magic will connect the emissary to the new host. But mid-conversation, Kavanaugh's caught off guard as Travis does not seem to understand the full plan. This throws Travis for a loop when suddenly we hear the voice of Asmodee. Asmodee proclaims he overestimated his human hosts and underestimated the power of change agents versus evil. In order for Asmodee to prevail with the dark forces of the earth, he needs to fully become one with another Besides Travis, Travis is shocked and frightened to lose the powerful force of Asmodee. He pleads and begs to give any and everything, but unknowingly realizes he already has given any and everything 
to Asmodee. Asmodee penetrates through the flesh and orifices of Travis Lane as he screams in agony. Ariana turning away, but Kavanaugh looks on astonished at what he sees. The remains of dust and bone leave a pile on the floor as Asmodee now stands before Henry Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh then gives full consent to the demon to enter his body. The power aligns himself with every sinister cell that flows in the body of Henry. After Henry looks at his reflection, the demon forewarns him that he is his own person and he will intervene only when necessary. Accepting these terms, Henry walks out, telling Ariana to let the cat clean up the mess of the fleshly, dustly, bony pile. Captain America leaves the building of the crime scene but sticks around outside once Misty Knight and the dog Doctor Strange drive off. In his experience, Captain America is used to people hiding or running away when it comes to acts of money, power, or fear. But when it's personal, they don't hide. That is when he notices that someone is looking, lurking, and waiting. And that person is Henry Cavanaugh, the new emissary, newly infused with the power of the demon Asmodee. Standing on a car, Henry Cavanaugh first gives Steve accolades of admiration, but his partner demon residing inside him, Asmodee, made the mistake in the past of letting Steve live back in his anti-Nazi pre-Captain America days. Now he won't make the mistake allowing him to further the cause of change agents. Captain America remembering again that things from the past repeat and the same moment is always present no matter what time. With Henry Cavanaugh, Asmodee, jumping from a car and Captain America Steve Rogers lunging forward, both men are ready to rock and roll to see who will walk away and who will not. This is the rhythm of the Yeah! Come on, let's go, bro.